Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host, Mark Padovestro. John, today we've got Andrea Myers, who's going to cover off outbound calls and how to maximize your success in topping up walk-in and internet leads with outbound call activity. Yeah, it's such an important part of the business, the outbound calls, often so difficult for sales consultants to do. So it's really worth a listen. If you enjoy listening to our episode, please remember to subscribe on the button below and like us on LinkedIn. Let's jump into the show. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Andrew, thanks very much for joining us on the show today. Great to have you on. Can you maybe, just to kick things off, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've done? Absolutely. Well, thanks, John, and thanks, Mark. I really appreciate the the opportunity to come talk to you guys. I'll give you a very high level summary because my certainly my experience is a little bit has got quite a variety involved with it. But I started retail, and that's really a good thing. At a, and I started working in a, with a Hyundai brand in South Africa at a, at a sort of like in the mid twenties, and very very quickly I adapted and um, and I really took to the selling world very well and became one of the, the top salespeople for them. And the, in the country. And this is probably the reason was because my father, you know, I spent many, many years growing up on dealership floors through him and he was in the automotive industry all his life. And then when I, when I really took a, a real liking to what I did, I decided I'd need a bit more experience. So I joined Audi in South Africa, more OEM experience and then immigrated to New Zealand and I, I continued there with the BMW brand. And 14 years ago, I started my own business and I've really enjoyed it. So the experience that I have that I can bring to conversation is that I've got both retail, OEM, as well as training experience. So it makes up for a nice, a nice ingredient. But what I've really enjoyed about this journey so far is that I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with multi multi brands, multi dealerships, different countries, different people, and that experience is actually quite unique in itself. And I've really, really enjoyed that. And is, is, is really something that I've treasured the most and learned the most from is actual hands-on with those different dealerships throughout those that 14 years. Question for me, Andrew. Why don't salespeople like to make outbound telephone calls? And why is it so difficult for them? You know, th- those are two very, very good questions. And it, it's such an important topic. It really is because... You know, we, we don't, we, you know, we're, we're certainly the challenges that are out there right now, especially what we've just been discussing about the semiconductor issues, stock supply, inquiry rates. There's so much out there that is fluctuating and on a month-to-month basis. So the, the reason why um, the salespeople aren't as good as they should be you know, they don't, they don't make the outbound calls like they should is because, first of all, it's a cultural thing, I think, first of all, and most importantly, it's not tracked very well. You look at go to dealerships and you can ask any one of them, you know, what, how many outbound calls do your team make? Not too sure. You know, average are four or five or so, you know, in terms of that. But the reason why they don't like to make the calls is because it's hard. You know, it really is difficult. You know, you, you think about on average, they're making, they should be making an average 10 calls a day. Then they don't do it consistently enough. They give it a go and they stop. So it's the effort and reward that really is um, the sort of the, the challenge that they have. You know, when on the flip side, you look at the inbound lead inquiries they get, you look at the walk in traffic, they think, oh, that's so much easier. It really is. And it's, uh, they tend to focus on where the low hanging fruit is, where if they realize that when they get the outbound calls absolutely nailed, 
the benefit to them is massive, absolutely massive. And a little bit later on, I'll show you some of the numbers that they can work on. And it's, it's really, really easy. I think the other reason is that they really don't have a solid plan of attack. They don't, you know, from the attitude they go, I've given them a go, I've tried it. They don't believe that if they put a proper plan in place and they do it every day, that things will start to turn around for them very effectively. So it also is a lack of focus in terms of that. You know, they, they don't have a real clear plan or focus like they should as they would be. And once again, this is a manager's role to make sure that every day they should be having a list on who they're calling, what they want to achieve with them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's really why they don't like to make the calls. The, the difficult part for them is that, like I said earlier, they're not tracking and measuring it consistently enough to get a true indication of what they get out of it. Because you think about it, you, you expect a 10% sort of success rate, you know, and they think, well, I must put in all this work to get only a 10% success rate. But as we know, appointments sell cars, you know, and all we're looking for, the whole purpose on outbound calls is to top themselves up, you know, because they've got to see a certain amount of opportunities to hit their sales targets. So that really is, is probably the two or the couple of reasons why I do think that they don't like them and they, they find them very difficult. Yeah, I think, Andrew, too, the fact is that you, when you're only getting a 10% success rate, psychologically it feels like you're getting knocked back, knocked back, knocked back. But it's all numbers game. If you see call 10 people, you have one success. If you call 20 people, you have two successes. And then you start to remember the, the successes. So pretty hard and tough psychologically. And you have to understand and not take it personally. Yeah. I mean, have you ever heard of the concept of the customer untraining cycle? And what that is, is in the, in the world that every day, their customers are coming to them and untraining them every single day, unwinding all their skill sets that they have. When you relate this back to making the outbound calls, the exactly the same thing happens. You know, every day they go, oh, they'll think of a reason not to do it. I know I'm going to get no. I know I'm going to get uh, not for me, thanks. We're not ready yet. And very, very, very little positive, you know, and as human beings, we, we, we crave acknowledgement. We crave success. And on top of that, with no managers coaching and guiding and directing, they resort back to what they know best, which is doing very little about it. And to me, that really is a tragedy, actually. And I'll tell you a true story. In New Zealand, there's a current dealer principal who manages a Ford and Mazda dealership. And he started at a very, very prominent big Ford established dealership in Auckland. And he was, and, he, and most of the team had worked there 20 plus years. So they were very established and he was brand new to the industry. First couple of weeks went by and he, you know, he just, he would walk up to someone and they're going, no, I'm here to see this person, that person. And he said, if, I, if, I, if I'm going to eat and, and survive, I need to do something different. So he sat back in an office, he grabbed the database and he just started making calls and calls. And he said he would do up to 30, sometimes 40 a day. Soon, he realized very quickly that people started saying yes. And it was within a couple of months, three to six month period, customers were walking in saying, hey, is so-and-so here? And you go to that dealership today and you look up on their sales board and you see how many times his name is on that board, salesman of the month, salesman of the month, because of that. And he was very lucky that he learned very early on the power of the outbound call. There's just so many stories like that that has had the success once they've got their head around effort and reward principle. So with that effort reward principle, you mentioned the sales manager. Now, I'm keen to get an understanding as to what role the sales manager plays with getting the sales consultants to overcome that fear or reluctance to make those outbound calls. You know, Mark, that's another good question. And, and it's really so important because to me, that ingredient with coupled to the fact that making them is, is so important. And I see this time and time again where managers just go, John, just go make your calls. Don't bother me. Don't come back until you've made them. And there's very little guidance and direction. So the manager's role um, for me is, A, he's got to be able to do it just as well, if not better, because from a coaching perspective, first of all, we need to understand that it's a 24-7 a role. The second thing he's got to do is get them to see what he sees. He's got to get them on his side saying, listen, well, if you make these calls, 
this is what's going to happen, you know, and get them to really understand that because once he started that journey with them, getting them the end result is for them to actually get out there and get motivated and actually make those calls himself and as well as with the team. So from a coaching perspective, that's the part one is getting them to be on side with you and get them to really see what he sees. The second part, which is very difficult, is catching them doing it right and wrong because why that is so important is because when you don't, they're going to naturally resort back to what they they wired and turned me to do, which is very little. So he's got to be sitting there and, and walking past and listening to their phone calls. Have you ever been to a dealership recently? And this is the first thing I do when I walk in, I listen for phone calls. And I can tell you <laughs> there is very little of that being done right now. So whenever I walk into a dealership and I'm sitting with a manager, I want to hear salespeople on the phone. I want to hear them on the phone. I want to hear that activity, that energy. And that's what his role is, is actually catching them, walking around and don't make it a thing, but just when he hears them doing it, say, listen, I heard you on the phone right now. That was brilliant. Well done. I love the word tracks you used, what we discussed earlier on. And that that acknowledgement makes a huge difference. So some of the managers always catch him doing it wrong and which really does turn them off. And they become quite scared and quite shy. So the minute they see the manager coming around, they sort of put the phone down and keep typing and do what they could do. When he's gone, they pick the phone up. And, and to me, that's really the, the, the counter coaching that sometimes does happen through lack of experience. But the, the role of the manager as the coach is absolutely paramount because it also sets the right culture in the business. You know, if you look at any successful business out there right now, you go to all the old school dealer principles, they are absolutely adamant that these phone calls need to happen every single day. And um, because that's what they did in their day. That was the only way they would ever get um, leads. That's a really good question and, and something that I'm really passionate about. In fact, in all the training sessions and all the events that we do, the it's the coaching part for the managers that's so important and that I really, we, we really should be focusing on. And how important is it for the manager to be basically the psychologist? The sales consultant has just been rejected. They've made nine calls and all nine have said go away or not answering and just giving them a flat out rejection. And you mentioned that's one in 10. How does the sales manager get that consultant to butter up up against again after they've been knocked down nine times and make that 10th call and get that appointment? You know, there, there's various ways. Obviously, um, incentives are something that really works well, but just that acknowledgement. You know, for me as human beings, that's one thing we crave. Is, is sometimes it's not about financial rewards. It's just about acknowledging what they've done really well and, and keeping that because when I used to do these sales events, for me, success wasn't the that was just part, the result was part one of their success. The, the second part for me was during that week and the build up to the actual event itself, when I heard a salesman click and find their groove and find their way of doing it and were successful, that look on their face, you know, you want them to make 150 calls and make 15 appointments. You know, try and do that over three days. That's that's a lot of coaching and motivating. But as they're feeling down about it, that next phone call, they get that appointment, it, it, it all disappears. It really does. And then they try and remember, and the role as a manager is to keep them motivated with little, little incentives along the way and acknowledgements. To me, and I see that more so than any financial reward, is just saying, hey, well done, and they're seeing the benefits of that. And then the next step is to make sure they arrive. So it's a real team collaborative effort, and it's a day-by-day -day thing too. You know, it's like because some days they'll make 10 calls and get five appointments. The next day, 10 calls and no appointments. On an average, it averages out quite nicely. So that, that role is, as I said earlier, 24-7, and it's, it just doesn't end, and it's so important. Yeah, Andrew, I think it's a really good point there is being with them while they're having it tough and just being to support them so that when they do get the ups, they, it really boosts them, uh, you know, from that point. Now, Andrew, are there different types of outbound calls? And should you take a different approach to those different types of calls? Definitely. John, just one point on that before I answer that question, going back to the coaching, is the, the manager mustn't make it a thing or an event because 
The problem is that managers should be spending 70% of their time with their sales guys on the floor, meeting, greeting customers, and really being that extra resource. But what happens nowadays is that the managers are sitting behind their desk and viewing the world from their office, which is a really bad place to do it from. And they're not getting out there. And because when you're on the floor, you can just hear from a distance, picking up the phones, that phone call, that, and you have that ability to mix in and go and, and, and really, really get in and, and work with the team. I find some really good managers saying, well, you know what? I've seen managers just sit down and say, right, give me, give me 10 of your customers. I'll make the calls for you right now and sit with them and do the calls and say, well, that was tough. And they start sharing these experiences too. And that just, from a team perspective, builds massive, huge success and culture. Getting back to your question now about what types of calls, because there are, especially from an outbound perspective, and I'd like to clarify, what, what the area of outbound call that I'm really passionate about is the area where salespeople have to make these prospecting calls to generate their own opportunities. Because we we'll talk about KPIs coming up, but from a KPI perspective, there, there is no expectation for them to do that. And they always fall short. Whenever you look at when someone's short on their sales results, you look at how many outbound calls they've done. So with that salespeople do, they say they misunderstand this concept sometimes. They go, well, I'm making lots of calls. I'm doing that. But they're making lots of calls to follow up deliveries. They're sort of, they're, they're sold customers. You know, they're, they're various or they're active prospects, you know, where we're looking at this area of outbound calls purely as a growth, as an area that's going to generate fresh opportunities for them. And there are some various types of calls that they can do that. So let's go through them. There's, there's about six of them. So the first one, the one that's really probably the most important is, is more from a nurturing perspective right now, and that's the forward orders or the signed orders that, that they have. And as we know right now, that's really a lot of cars. You know, these, these dealerships are arriving with months of forward sales, six, seven, eight months ahead. So the question I always ask is, what are they doing about it? You know, they, they should be nurturing that customer all the long from, from the time the order's arrived to the time that the car arrives at the dealership. They do nothing. So their course in this area should be, as it goes to production, I'd just like to let you know that your car's gone into production. It should be your car's finished production. It's been loaded on the ship. The ship has arrived. It's gone through clearance. So they're just nurturing these, their, their, their orders to make sure that they are still going to take delivery when the car actually arrives. So that's really important. The second call is the active prospecting call. So these are the people that have walked in and or they've come in through an internet lead. They, they want to convert them and get them in. So they are basically a suspect. We want to convert them into prospect and get them in, which is very important. And, and I'll tell you a true story. It's regarding the inbound because they have quite a few um, various sources of inbound. There's social, the dealer website. There's, there's a third-party websites like car sales or, or auto trade all that. And they all come into one area and they're giving these leads and they've got to keep them. So recently did a research and I mystery shopped 59 dealers, all right? 59, both new and used. And I used their, their dealer website and I sent her an inquiry and a question to come back on. Out of the 59, 21 replied to me, 21, which is 36%. And of that, two were within these sort of KPIs or the benchmarks that I set, which was quite simple. I expected a call within 30 minutes and only two managed that because, you know, we know that after 30 minutes, two hours, that, that, pretend, that person searched five or six websites, he's forgotten who you are. So from an outbound call from their perspective, that's an area. And these are leads coming in. These are given to them by the dealership and they're still not doing a a really good job with that. You know, they could, it could be a lot quicker than that. Another one is the database call. You know, when a salesman starts, they, they have a database of 500, so they get given a database from a previous person or orphan owners or whatever it might be. And they need to. For me, that, that, this, this is a gold mine. This is the absolute gold mine. So the first thing I suggest they do is find out who are still active. That's the first thing, all right? Once they know who's active, the second question I'd ask is when or how often do they typically replace the 
current vehicle. They say, oh, every five years, whatever. And the salesman can look at delivery day and say, oh, that's this year or that's next year. And set up a future appointment, say, I'm going to give you a call in July or August, and we're going to get you back in and have a look at some amazing cars and start that dialogue from there. Of course, you have the um, service department, which is an area that, you know, sales professionals spend so much time looking at the showroom when the next walk is going to come and when there's 20 to 30 of their customers coming in every single day. That's an area that I, I never see utilized correctly. And it's a gold mine, an absolute, absolute gold mine. You know, especially with the, D, the DMS system they have right now, they could set it up that every day. They could say to the service managers, give me anyone that's coming in today that's owned their car for X amount of period or that mileage or, or spent that amount of dollar value on their service. I want to call these people. You know, that's that's the first phase. If they're really confident, how about finding out when they're coming back to collect their car and meet them, you know, or in the morning, take them and drop them off at work, you know. So there, there are there are various ways. So that we've covered the active the, the active prospect, the database, service department, internet inquiry. Also, there's various sources of that too. And I find that. You know, there's um, um, from a from the, the third party to social leads now to, um, you know, from their own website, from the manufacturer's website. It's actually, it's quite a big area and they do rely on that um, quite a lot to get those leads. So there are many, many areas. And of course, the last one is when they eventually, when we have enough stock, do these sales events again. It's not about the, the people that you appoint for the event. For me, that's that's a byproduct. It's more about you, you've given a list of 150 people each on average, each salesperson. You know, you've spoken to probably, let's say, 130 of them, or you, let's say you call all of them. But out of that whole list, 25 people actually show up in the event. So what about the other 125? These people are They've been emailed something, they've been text something, they've received a call from you, but there's something that's just not ready yet. So keep in contact with them. You know, it's, it's something else that they should be doing. And the last area I would really look at is, we let's just say a salesperson sees about 50 customers or opportunities a month and sells 15 cars, right? What do they do with the other 35 that they saw that didn't buy a car from them that month? Most of them just drop them and look for the next month. So I always say, keep rolling them. You know, can you imagine what happens to your opportunity base? Keep in contact. Something's changed that other couldn't get finance or whatever. Find out what's changed because they they initially inquired and came in for a reason. And there's something in that process that a very few of them, they might not like you. So that's fine. You know, we're just going to pass it on to someone else. But, you know, for they couldn't get finance or they went a bit cold, you couldn't get the car they wanted. There might have been a reason that they couldn't actually turn that into a sale. So keep in contact because something will change. And you want you you want to be that first person that they call back and say, I'm ready to buy. And that's an area that I'm really passionate about because they always say to me, oh, there's not enough business out there. We've got enough. But when you start adding all these areas up and just take little chunks out of each one, put that together with a, a campaign on for outbound calling. Why are you calling? We can put scripts together. Realizing it suddenly changes the whole world. I always ask every salesperson one question. And I always say to them, if you work from home and you didn't have a showroom to come to, how would you go about your business? And the answer is always, oh, I spend a lot of time on the phone, talking to the database, talking to my customers. Then why aren't you doing it here? So it really gets them to think about that really nicely. I think it's interesting, Andrew, because I think there's official research being done that 30% of customers take more than 90 days to buy a vehicle. That's exactly what you're saying. And most salespeople will drop that customer within 35, 40 days. They won't follow up anymore. So they lose a big chunk of customers. And if they can roll that, you've got 30% rolling over the next 90 days. It, it all adds up. It, it exponentially, it literally triples their, their opportunity base. If they just keep in contact, it really does. It's a, it's, it's, you're right, 100% correct there, John. It really is that there's always a 30% set of the database that aren't ready yet, just got to keep nurturing. Andrew, a question for me, re the outbound calls. So right now, 
we've gone through those five areas or the sixth one with the sales event when stock frees up. So if a consultant or a sales manager or even a dealer for that matter, was keen to get going with this out with a really structured regime of outbound call. Where should that salesperson start? I would start with their database. Well, first of all, I would make that commitment. I would get, for me as a sales professional, I would say, right, I am going to. And and it's something that we always, you've, you've got to begin with the end in mind. So we always want to make sure that they understand. Let's look at how many opportunities am I short? How many would I get from my walking, from internet leads, um, all these other areas? And it adds up to, let's just say, 35, and they need 50. So where are the other 15 coming from? So that, that sorts out the why. So once I've got that sorted, I'm going to make that commitment. And I'm going to make sure that once I've done that commitment, that I'm going to make an X amount of calls per day, basically to make get 15 opportunities, you know, you've got to probably make 150 odd calls to get that amount of appointments through on average, right? 10% success rate. So 150 over 20 days works out to be, so there's seven and it's not a lot. So I'll start with saying 10. Let's go make so so you start with that number. You're working it backwards to say right. You you it's almost like they're breaking it down to to the ridiculous. So I'm going to do ten a day, and then from there I'll say right. Who am I going to target? And the easiest are your at your current database. I would ask for a database called a 500 customers or or whatever. Start with 500 because you want to do ten a day. It's going to take a long time to work through, and I would start with that. So. You look at 10 calls a day, you know, you're looking at 200 calls a month. You look at a 10% success rate, so there's 20 appointments. And we know that 10 will arrive, 50% kept appointment ratio, and out of that, you'll sell two to one. So there's five deals that you're doing just by making 10 calls a day. And the database, and these I call them warm calls because these are customers that have bought cars from you. The challenge we have is that these databases have been churned and mixed and mangled with lost sales, with opportunities. You want a database with that are people that have bought cars from the dealership only. You want the rest gone. So these are people that have bought a car from that dealership X amount of years ago, going back from year one through seven, and you start working that. And from that, the, there's that simple, easy plan you imagine you exponentially multiply that over your whole sales team. The difference it makes to the inquiry rate is incredible, absolutely incredible. And it's something I always recommend, and I've always put that even after sales events that we used to do. And, and I've had some managers actually put that plan in place, and they say you cannot believe the difference it makes. They forget about the chat, the, the issues, that they expect that those results, and they keep working that. Because could you imagine... And this is the, the, the sell that I say to managers. You sell the concept that you've got a database of 500 and in those 500, you know that you've spoken to all of them and that you know that they are all currently driving your brand. And you also know the second question I would ask is how often do you typically replace it? Because then I'm going to know out of the 500, when are they replacing? So... If, if the, the life cycle is five years, for argument's sake, that means 100 customers in my database are replacing every year. And I want to know more or less within that 12-month period, when are they replacing? So that, that sales professional will wake up every month and you have 15 customers that have told them at some point, I'm ready to, I mean, I'll think about changing in this period, in this month, in this year. And they start the month on such a groundswell, the risk really falls into place. So... That, to me, it's not a difficult thing to do. It really isn't. It's just about putting that in place and then managing and then coaching that, especially in the, at the beginning when you need to get through. And something that managers don't do, you know, very, very well here is that I always recommend that they should have a, a literally a five to 10 minute session every morning, a one-on-one -on -one with every salesperson on my team. Not together. That's a huddle. I must have a one-on-one -on -one and I must make sure that that person has their day planned, who they're calling, what, what point was coming back, why they want to get them, what's their step. So I know if I don't talk to that salesperson again, 
that I know that they've got their day ready, especially with the outbound calls. As far as strategy, so we, we, we touched on where they get started with making a list and uh, and having a warm list of existing customers and having that one-on-one meeting with the sales manager and having the day planned. What other strategies do they need to follow or un- employ to have success? So just in terms of the different strategies, you know, what um, you know, for, for me, it's it's starting with that. You know, it's about having a consistent one. It really is to me, first and foremost. Um, but like I said, I would start with that, and I would start with just the database. If they don't have a database, then look for something else. But you could know, look at service department because how many of your service departments, the customers that come through for a service, didn't buy from you? How many would they be? We need to talk to those people because we know that they bought somewhere else for some reason, but service with us. So I, w- I would look at that strategy too. I would really, really make sure that this is once again really simple steps going through. You could even go into the past department and say, well, give me your top 30 spenders in the past department. And once again, no matter what plan they have, it ultimately ends up being that there are a certain amount of volume of calls they've got to do today and the manager's coaching that every single day, right? What happened yesterday? How did you go? Et cetera, et cetera. And they've got to update their CRM system at the same time. So from a strategic perspective, I would really, really have, um, I really work on that because there are so many different areas that you can have. But, you know, once I know my database, when they're replacing, once I know, you know, it's suddenly you're adding all the walk-in traffic, it's, it's really, really, really simple. And when you show them by making 10 calls a day, they're going to sell five cars. You committed as a manager to help them actually achieve that. So you set those goals together and you achieve them together. And it's just a winning formula. It really is. I mean, if they've got no database, think about, you think about the broader Australian market. I think we've got 25 million people. I think about 7, 14% of our population change their car every single year. So if they just got to take a phone book and start phoning 100 names out of the phone book, 14% of those should be interested in buying a car or doing something. You know, it's, it's like we know dealerships all have databases and we just got to make sure that they are pure and correct. But the numbers are astounding when you actually do look at it. So, and there are different areas that they can look at from a, from a strategic perspective too. You're not doing outbound calls for all your customers. You're doing the outbound calls to top up and make sure you get to the targets and the levels you want to achieve because you're going to get your walk-ins, you're going to get the guys coming through other areas, but this is just to top up. So it's not like you want to try and get 100%. You're only trying to get a portion of your of your sales every month and make sure that you guarantee that in the future. Absolutely. You know, dealerships should be um, uh, putting in a, a certain KPI, and I'm going to talk about KPIs now because there's certain statistics that they should stick to when they're putting these things together. So the first thing is that I've always believed that um, a dealership should be responsible for attracting at least 60% of the targeted opportunities each month. So through their own marketing and they're through their own, um, they, they should be attracting 60% or even 70%. The salesperson should be looking at getting 30% of their own opportunities through their own marketing, through their own networking. Yeah, And there's, in fact, I pulled out, was about, when I just moved to New Zealand, I put together a 21 ideas for prospecting. And, um, you know, it's still two thirds of those are still pertinent today. So that's the first KPI I would put in place. So that sets the culture that there's an expectation right from the top that I've got to find 15 to 20 opportunities myself. All right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is from a KPI perspective. So I mentioned some of the numbers before, and when we used to do these outbound call campaigns recently because the sales events and walk and we weren't allowed to, through COVID, go to dealerships, we had certain KPIs that worked really, really well for us. And the first one is call time. We used to say that we used to try and average three minutes a call. So I used to know that if my call agents were talking for three minutes on the phone or even two and a half to three minutes, that they were engaging. They were having a quality conversation on the phone. 
I could measure and I would see that it's somewhere with 30, 45 seconds. And when you consider by the time the phone rings and someone answers and they do the introduction, it's 30 seconds already. And they're putting the phone down, I knew there was a problem there. So that's three minutes per call. The next one was, of course, a couple of the other simple KPIs we'd look at. So the first one was um, call volume was one. Connects, meaning from when the, someone picks the phone up, that would be 50%. We'd expect a 50% connect ratio. We know from there, that's where the magic happens. You can't do anything just leaving a voicemail. The next one would be made appointments was the next KPR. So we'd expect a certain amount that usually would be 10% of call volume would be appointments made. And the final KPR would be appointments kept. And that would be literally 50% of appointments made. So the reason why we used to put these KPIs in place was it told me two things. It told me what to coach. And from a manager's perspective, and Mark, you mentioned earlier about managers and what their role is, from a coach perspective, if they're tracking and measuring those numbers, it tells them two things. It either says, right, if they do, um, if the core volume is there, if they um, connect to appointment ratio is low, it's a skill issue. If it's if they're not doing the volume of calls, it's an effort issue. So they know what areas, there's two areas, effort or skill they need to focus on. And those KPIs will tell them exactly what to work on because you get guys that do half the volume of calls and they make incredible amount of appointments and suddenly none of them show. So you know, it tells a story for a manager. And once they learn how to use these numbers to coach, it's a game changer. It really is. And that's what we like to do. And that's what um, really good managers do this very, very well. Uh, Andrew, if there's anyone interested to get in contact with you, uh, how should they reach out to you? Um, well, a couple of ways. Um, the first thing is obviously my email. They can call me on my email, which is andrew at dtsexperience.com. And the on my mobile, 47 8899 And we, we just coincidentally, we um, are running this uh, um, Mastering the Outbound Core program at the moment, and it's, um, it's, it's actually had quite a lot of good, amazing traction at the moment. Um, uh, just sent an email out the other day, and we've got 48 people registered already. So it's obviously resonating with a lot of dealerships, and it's a lot of fun. There are a lot of activities, a lot of role play, and they'll get a lot out of it. So if they really would like to, then just please get hold of me, and, and, I, and I appreciate the, the time that you give me tonight. I really do. Thank you very much. So, Andrew, uh, if I may summarize fantastic conversation that we've just had and what you've shared with us and our listeners is... You're a car person, you've grown up, the DNA is your, your father was, was in dealerships, you spent time in dealerships and then you moved into retail yourself. Uh, you've spent time in uh, manufacturer land, so you've got retail, OEM, and you're a trainer. So you understand how the business works on both sides and you know how to actually engage and train people. And the beauty is you've actually done it across a number of brands, a number of dealerships, but also a number of countries because you're an you're a international uh, operative and working in South Africa, New Zealand and Australia. So you've got the Southern Hemisphere covered and you understand how business, the automotive business is done in these markets. So lots of credibility there. And then when we ask the question about why don't salespeople make outbound calls? Because rightfully we talked about how hot the market is and lots of inbound stuff. The skill of the outbound call is disappearing and it disappears very quickly because we all slide into habits of how easy is it when the fish are jumping into the boat it's hard to actually cast the line and catch the fish and that's what an outbound call is and the reason why they don't do it is it's hard it's difficult and there is no plan in place to do it so this is where it's the low-hanging fruit is the walk-ins because they're easier but the job of the sales manager and the dealer principal is to be a coach and a psychologist as well in many ways from what you're saying because first and foremost, they've got to instill belief in the consultant that, hey, this is what you need to do, the why. They've got to build the why and get that focus from the consultant to actually do it because if they do it and then you work on the numbers game that, and the strategies that you put, put in place, it's about where do you start? 
and you identified the key places to start is, well, start with your forward orders, engage those people because you're going to get some really great interaction with them of people who are waiting for their vehicles. A lot of cars coming on water, a lot of cars people are waiting for. So engage with them, keep them warm. They're going to be your referrals in years, in the months, years to come. So first and foremost, nice and warm months. Then you've got your active prospecting calls for people that have been coming in and you're, you're working those. But then there's the database call and there is gold in the database and you outline that and, and we'll go through what the, the key metrics are with that. But don't forget the service department and also the other internet inquiry that you've got and the sales events. So there are all the sources of those calls to make. But it all comes down to what are the strategy? It's all about commitment. You gotta to commit to the process. You gotta believe, and this is where the sales manager has the job to sit the consultants down and do that coaching, but also do the one-on-one -on -one coaching to show what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. Often leaders will tell what people are doing wrong and ignore what they're doing right but all of us are precious petals. And I found the, the best sales consultants are the most socially insecure people. They need that sale to validate that they are still being liked by somebody. So if you've got an insecure individual who you know needs that shot of endorphins and dopamine for when they do a deal, they're the ones that just need to be coached because they'll make those calls to get that deal. So it's very much about planning the day but also having that one-on-one. -on -one. But then you talked about the things that really stood out for me, and I love this, <clears throat> because these are the metrics that matter. We did a podcast, John, earlier this year, where we had uh, the measure of dwell time in dealerships and the correlation between dwell time and sales and how uh, you can look at the macro data and see whether that dealer is efficient in attracting people into the showroom, but then there was the what do you do in the showroom. Marketing gets people in, but it's a sales consultant that does what's the time spent with customer in the showroom. And you talked about if you can put your plan together and just make 10 calls a day, but you start with a warm list, which is your database list, and there are customers and work out, well, what, what, are their, what are their cycles of changing the predictable events of their life? They're gonna change the car at some point. What is that? Engage with them. So 10 calls, but then there's the contact ratio. Making 10 calls and leaving 10 messages often can lead to very few callbacks. So it's this, the effort is making the call, but then you talked about the next three elements that really stood out, which is the skill. If the effort is there to make the 10 calls, the skill will come with the coaching and with engaging you in the services that you provide to get the ratios up. And those ratios are the, the connection ratio. So make the 10 calls, but you need to connect with at least 50% of them. So it's five connections. And then the other one, John, that really stood out for me was, which is similar to the Blix uh, discussion was, how long do you talk to them? If the call is a quick two seconds, see you later, well, that call is not a beneficial one. The longer you can spend time with that customer on the phone and spend that three minute KPI that you set and the skills that you teach the consultants in how to maintain that conversation for, 10, for three minutes, because People don't just decide to buy a car without speaking to anyone. They want to engage with, they want to trust someone. They would have done a lot of research, but if you're now a human face to that faceless data that they've read and looked at pictures, etc., but suddenly there's a human element that cares about them and their issues in, and, and uh, concerns about a car or a transportation solution, your opportunity is right there with that call. Three minutes builds that rapport and gives you the right to ask the next question for them to come in and go to that effort on their part to see you in the showroom. And once you're in the showroom, we know the conversion ratios increase exponentially. You know, 50% of, of walk-ins should be test-driven. In fact, it should be higher, but then 50% of test drives buy a car. So you get them into your showroom, get them in a car and buy a car. So those are the metrics that matter. And it makes sense for a dealership to reach out to you to make sure that the salespeople they've got aren't just sitting in the boat waiting for the fish to come in because this tide will turn. And what we need to do is make sure we have the skills for when the tide turns with the supply and when the customers now the demand equal supply, even maybe is less than less than what the, the uh, uh, oversupply occurs, we need outbound activity to make sure we top up on the marketing activity that the dealership gets. So it makes sense for them to reach out to you on LinkedIn. You've, they've got your mobile number, and, uh, and it makes a lot of sense to engage a service.
Well, thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate that. And absolutely, your summary was 100% spot on. And uh, it is such an important part of the of the the, the dealership um, daily activity. And it's incredibly important. And there are many dealerships that do do it well, but there are many that on the flip side that don't. And uh, I just certainly hope that whoever listens gets a little bit of value out of this. And, and if they yeah, just do something on their own and it makes a difference, to me, that's, that's hugely successful too. Well, I, th- I think it's amazing. 10 calls, connect with at least five of them, talk to them for three minutes, get them to come in for a, uh, an appointment. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that easy. And uh, we, we're the, sorry, just very quickly, just uh, on the um, making those calls, it's, the, it's the, the planning of them. It's the preparation too, you know. So it's the, and this is where that one-on-one comes in, why you want to talk to them, what's the benefit to them, you know. If I would say creating scripts, are something that gives them consistency and and it will just remove all the sort of bad habits from them, you know, in terms of the the words, the tone, the pitch, the phone etiquette, all these other areas we can train on and help them improve those, those that, that phone call itself and, and before they make it, the, the thought that goes behind, it's not just a matter of picking the phone up and going, why should I, what's the next step, why, and then make the plan, make the call with that plan in mind. Andrew, thanks very much for talking to us today. We really appreciate your time and sharing your experience with us. So thanks very much. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. That, that was very powerful stuff. I, I loved it when you just went bang, bang, bang. And it was like, what? It, a light went off with me, which was just so, but it's hard. It's, it's hard doing the 10 calls. And if you, if you start with the really hard stuff, you get disenchanted and disenfranchised very quickly. I mean I, I mean, I do it myself every day. You know, I sit down and I plan my calls, like who I'm calling, why. And, um, you know, even in terms of the, the way I create my elevator pitch, really, I think, well, I've got, I've got literally 10 seconds to grab this person's attention to say, all right, tell me more. The ability to handle objections, oh, we don't need you. All right, well, tell me a little bit more about what it's having the confidence to keep that conversation going because they're going to do their best to get you off the phone. But you've got to find something that would resonate with them to grab their attention. And that's what makes it harder because every sort of you were your fleet or your phony deal principal or general manager or whatever it might be, it's all very different. So you've got to think about who they are, their roles. And there's really a lot of thought behind it too that it's not just about picking the phone up and hoping like hell. I mean, you could do that and you'll, you'll get some success, but not... The, the what you really need. And it is difficult. And I find for myself personally, I've got to hit that reset button every day. Every morning I walk and say, right, whatever happened yesterday is history. I'm going to do something today and I'm going to go for it. And I get myself psyched up, then I make my calls. Hopefully you've enjoyed the discussion with Andrew Myers and his gems on how to improve your conversion ratios with outbound activity and where to start and the levers to pull. If you want to find out more, please reach out to either John Sinclair or myself on LinkedIn. Follow us on our YouTube channel, on Spotify and on iTunes. And also subscribe to our channel and click the like button below and the posts on LinkedIn. And thanks very much for listening. We'll talk to you again next week.